Hello all, I'm on another plane and I'm not actually on a plane back from Nam. this is uh, far too late. However, uh, I did take some great footage while I was there and so here is my Nam video. It is 3.20 in the morning. <laughs> just started the car to go to Heathrow Airport. It's a four hour drive if there's no traffic. This is gonna suck. I didn't get much sleep in the last four hours because I was half awake with uh, all flying anxiety at the end. Not fear of flying, but you know, all this stuff that goes with it. I'll be fine. <sighs> Let's get going. I made it to Heathrow three hours early. So uh, let's get something to eat. This uh, 3 a.m. start was a bit much. Who's the hurt? start of day one just got my badge and it's kind of cold and rainy here which is weird for uh, for california but let's get down to the pro audio section and start to see some of the cool people who make the mics and the speakers and all that kind of jazz before we get into guitar world i'm at the cranbourne audio uh, booth and they've got a new eq that is an eq but not an eq this is sean hey what's going on adam how you doing man good good so what the hell is this? Uh, the Carnaby. Good question. So uh, I could answer that a lot of ways. Basically, uh, Carnaby is the world's first harmonic EQ, uh, and it's the first new analog audio circuit in like four decades. Yeah. So um, you know, we we approach things slightly differently at Cranbourne. We're we like innovating. Like we like we like to move move technology forward. We like to do different things. So every analog EQ that's ever been invented uses phase to equalize the signal. Yeah. Uh, the Carnaby does not use phase to equalize the signal. It uses harmonics. Uh, right. So and and yeah and so that's how the, that's how a signal is being equalized on the Carnaby is using harmonics. So it leads to very different effects from what you're used to with an EQ. But make no mistake, it is an EQ. Though it uses harmonic saturation and analog you know analog saturation to equalize, it does not behave like a multi-band saturator or a multi-band exciter or anything like that. First of all. It's an EQ, so you can cut, right? So exciters and saturation modules can't cut. Yeah, you know. So this is an e this works like an EQ. So when you boost on 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 the Carnaby, you know you're going to be adding the you're going to be increasing the fundamental, but you're also going to be adding harmonics. Right. When you cut on the Carnaby, you'll be reducing the fundamental. You'll be reducing the the thing you want to you you want to clean up but you'll be getting harmonics around it. Uh, so you're reducing the peak level of the, you know, the boominess, the woofiness, whatever you're trying to get rid of, but then around in that frequency content is harmonically related, related content. So you don't all of a sudden lose everything in your audio. You know, it, yeah. and the RMS level actually stays the same, although the peak level reduces. So it's quite a useful thing, and uh, like it's incredible for mastering, it's, it's incredible for mixing, but it's also really great as a tracking EQ as well. Uh, yeah, you were telling me because it's not traditional EQ, it doesn't screw with the phase as well. That's another thing. Exactly. So, so um, yeah, it, it just doesn't use phase. So, so what you're when you're boosting, when you're cutting. You're bringing up or down the fundamental, but you're adding or, uh, harmonics, and that that's that's the that's the beauty of it. So, you know, when you play with it, when you get a feel for it, it does like the closest thing I'd say of of what uh, of, of to Carnaby is like a channel strip. So, because because the thing is. The, the key with the harmonic EQ is input gain and the output gain. So you see how on some of these units I have the input gain cranked, yeah. and then on other ones I have them all the way down? That determines how many harmonics you're adding. Ah. When you crank it, you're getting a lot of dynamic behavior. So like the peaks will be 3 to 6 dB, duck, they'll be getting clipped by 3 to 6 dB. So you're getting like compression-like effects, and the same sort of saturation that you would get from a compressor from that. Right. So, but then that only happens on the on the peaks, on the transients. Ah. Whereas the rest, you'll just get the, you, it, it won't be applying that effect to that. So it's a very dynamic, it's almost like a dynamic transient shaper as well. Wow. All in the same thing. So, point is like, you run audio through it, you just kind of get a finished 
sound in the uh, end. Because it, uh, it just does a lot. It does yeah. a lot of heavy lifting. And what's great about it, it's simple. It works like an EQ. So each, there's three bands. Uh, yep, th these are the booster cut for each band. So high, mid, and low. And then you have the frequency control. Simple. So it, so it works like an EQ, but under the, under the bonnet, a lot of stuff is happening. And it's adding a lot of tone shaping, a lot of, uh, a lot of you know, analog color. Yeah. And the other uh, feature that's just been introduced is the opto sync. It's kind of a stereo link. If, if you see on the shot here, um, like the left one's got all the controls changed, the right one doesn't, but it follows. So if I just turn that off, you'll see that that one turned off too. And turn back on, boom. So one, one module can control multiple modules. You just enable opto sync on the module you want to slave. So the, the main use case for this is obviously turning two mono EQs into a stereo EQ. But you could do a 5-1 surround, you could do a summing mixer, uh, you know, where, where they're all synced and stuff like that. But I think the crucial one is, you know, you can use mono EQs for tracking yeah. or for mono sources and mix down. But then now you're doing stereo sources, OptoSync, now you have a true stereo EQ. And they're perfectly matched. And they're perfectly matched, exactly. Wow. Exactly. So um, when can we expect to see these in the wild? So the legacy editions, these are the very first units we, we built. So me, Ben, the team, we hand built these units. Uh, in our office in the UK. Right. So this is serial number one, two, actually. Nice. Uh, that's my personal pair. I assembled those ones. But I assembled lots of them. I said we did 125 pairs. Uh, they were all pre-sold. And it's just a, bit, a little bit of audio history for people to get a hold of. Hand built by us, individually numbered, sequential serial numbers, certificate of authenticity, and they come in a Cranbourne flight case. So the, that's the very first units that are available. Um, and then the, once those sell out, uh, the Carnaby, normal standard uh, Carnaby 500 uh, will be available. It'll be available next month. So sweet. So that's, yeah, that next month for, for NAM, that's like unheard of. Doesn't normally happen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Not, not available maybe, maybe later or whatever. Yeah. Yeah, whatever they say, but uh, yeah, no, we, uh, yeah, we, we, we've been working on this for like four or five years, so it would have been pretty hard for us to, uh, to, to, to miss Nam after four or five years of hard work. So, yeah. Well, yeah, looking forward to it. Thanks, Adam. We'll, we'll make sure you get a pair. I get it. Great way to go through life. I highly recommend it. And eventually, you start to develop a little bit of vocabulary and a sense of how to contextualize things that you're learning about. And so, um, so here we are. Um, but they're really the ones who are sort of have the deeper knowledge. The fan doesn't open anything. Your dad is calling right now. Should I answer your dad? Okay. Okay, smile! Jesus, what is this potato cam? Is this an iPhone? Non-contact fader. What? Hey there, thanks 
Don't mind me, you're all right. <laughs> I mean, I'm not doing full interview segments this year, it just, it's a little easier, but this is the thing, this is the microphone that That's comes amazing. with it. Yeah, I mean, this is the first year, I'll just flip this round. This is Trevor from Sontronics. Hello there, how are you doing? And this is the first NAM where I've not had a handheld big microphone, and every year it's been a Sontronic solo. I'd be upset by that, but... What can I say? It's Evolution. The only reason is logistics, <laughs> but honestly, it's, it's the best the best handheld mic I've had. Cool. Uh, so yeah, these guys are English. Typical that I am uh, in LA talking to uh, uh, an Englishman. But there we go. Flip that around a bit. There we go. This is the new microphone. This is the Saturn II. What's uh, what can you tell me about it? Well, good to see you again, Adam. Um, it's been three and a half years almost since we've been back at the NAMM show, so we're very happy to be here again. Um, the Saturn II is the evolution of the original Saturn that was launched 13 years ago at this very show. Um, very sadly, back then, we were midway through production, about five, six years into it, and a lot of the parts, the original parts, became obsolete, so we were left in a real problem, a huge conundrum. So we spent the following years trying to find ways of using modern, more modern components, um, and this is the outcome. So this is essentially seven years of labor uh, to get to this point. Um, we've basically upgraded the, the, the circuit de design. We've kept the original circuit design structure, but the component build has been taken to the highest level. So we're now using the very best components you can find. Everything's automotive grade, so absolutely as precise as can be. Um, ironically, that also caused us a bit of a problem over the last couple of years, as you'll probably know that throughout the automotive industry and electronics industry, huge shortage of chips. So we were also putting a bit of a back, back step there. But everything has come together now. So what we've got here is an evolution of the original microphone, keeping the same form factor. So this will be recognizable. The iconic design is still the same. A little bit of a thicker outer ring here just to sort of help denote the new microphone. On the front panel here, you see the LEDs points here. Um, you've got the five cardinal patterns, so your omni, wide cardioid or subcardioid, cardioid, hypercardioid, and figure of eight. But also, this has an intermediate position as well. So not only do you have those five cardinal patterns, you've also got four intermediate, so nine in total. So essentially, just by moving the control dial, if you do this here, you now get this intermediate double LED position to let you know you are between those two positions. So again, programmed by an integrated circuit, an IC. So this is sending 
specific voltages to either side of the capsule to ensure precision in terms of that polarity. Um, back to the original Saturn's features, we've got the same filter here, the 75 hertz cut, and also the 125 hertz cut, which is not the 150, which is quite common, but the 125, which I found personally to work beautifully with jumbo, uh, country jumbo acoustic guitars, so that the sort of huge whoop of air that you get out of the sound hole, that takes that out and you just still get that beautiful sound of the wood sound, the strings, everything's there. Um, also the pad and over this side here, minus 10 and minus 20 dB pad. I was asked several times what the mic's for, and ultimately this is the go to it. Get every, everything that you want to record, this mic will, will take out. You know, it's a studio-based microphone, as you can probably understand, but everything from speech and vocals where it absolutely excels, all the way through every kind of acoustic instrument, and even room ambience. And one of the things to mention that because it's such a precise microphone in terms of its construction and, and the electronic circuit, using this as a stereo pair will give you just utter precision as a stereo setup. So lots and lots to, to be excited about with this mic. Amazing. Thank you very much, Trevor. We'll see you soon. Thank you very much. So, end of day one and I've seen a lot of people, met a lot of people, uh, seen a few new cool, cool products, looked around the entire Yamaha booth where uh, there were loads and loads of really cool looking uh, assistants there to, uh, to help and talk to people, all of whom ignored me. Didn't, uh, not, not a single one of them even said hello. Cheers, Yamaha. And so, yeah, ah well, I won't be going back up to that floor. It uh, looks like tomorrow I'm going to be doing a lot more filming uh, with guys like uh, Roswell and a lot of the microphone companies and doing a lot more fun stuff on the guitar side. So, see you then. Now I'm going to go and sleep the sleep of a thousand deaths because I am tired. Day one. Chorizo fries with an egg. Oh, it's bigger than I thought. Cool. to demo, I'm reading it from my notes here, the, uh, the world premiere of the GPU-powered Vienna Symphonic Library uh, 3D Pro. So let's check that out. Asks and they use multi-dimensional signals. Um, also we have classic audio processing DSP algorithms have a lot of data dependencies that prevent them from being able to um, you know, run in parallel. So traditionally audio is uh, processed sequentially. On GPU audio, we are uncovering how to process that in parallel on the GPU architecture. I'm with Matt from Roswell Audio, and they've got a new microphone, which is a version of my favorite microphone of all time. Tell us about the Aztec. Right on. Uh, first of all, welcome. Thanks for coming by. I uh, appreciate seeing you. Yeah. It's fun to be here. So, uh, yeah, so we are Roswell Pro Audio, and we are launching today, or this week at NAM a microphone called the Aztec. And uh, the Aztec is named after a city in New Mexico where a UFO landed or crashed, depending on who was driving. And uh, 
as Adam said, it's based on the Elam 251, and it's not a it's not a clone. I know there's a lot of things that claim to be clones, and a lot of the ones that I've heard have left a little bit to be desired. And so, uh, so we were not slavish about recreating history. What we wanted to do was recreate the sound of that. And I think it's worth noting that you know when the original 251 was made, everybody recorded the tape. Yeah. Which sounds a little different than recording to a digital media, right? right? And there was some frequency shifting and some high frequency loss that would that would go on. And so okay. a brighter microphone back in the day wasn't necessarily such a bad thing. Yeah. Because you wouldn't necessarily get all that top end back off the tape. But now that there's, you know, high fidelity and zero loss when recording digitally, you have to be a little more careful about your high frequencies especially around transients. So, what we wanted to do though was maintain that airy top end without any kind of hint of harshness or, you know, being too bright. Uh, if I liked bright microphones, I wouldn't be standing here because there's so many of those out there already. Like, you could pick, take your pick. There's bright microphones everywhere. So, uh, but we did want to maintain uh, the, the sort of airy top end. That's one of the characteristics of that kind of mic. And then that kind of big, you know, enveloping low low end as well. Yeah, all the big valve kind of harmonic series kind of thing. Yeah, and it is a valve mic, and so you are getting some harmonic saturation in there. Um, but we've added, we also wanted to make it versatile. So we've added uh, both a pad and a filter, uh, and there are switches right on the mic, so you can do a low frequency roll off, you can, you can do an attenuation pad for louder sources. And then on the power supply, there is a nine position uh, pattern control. And so it's, uh, you know, nine patterns, so, you know, Omni on one end, figure eight on the other end, cardioid in the middle, and then all the interstitial patterns. And they're re uh, repeatable from session to session. So like if you're, you know, you're one or two clicks past cardioid, you can write that down on your session notes and you know exactly how to get exactly that right. next time. Amazing. But uh, I think what's interesting about these, what I hope is interesting, and certainly what's interesting for me about them is that we have a sort of no compromise attitude on the components. Yeah. So both the mic and the power supply have our own custom made Roswell branded electrolytic capacitors in certain locations. Right. And uh, and we've got, you know, very fancy uh, and very expensive capacitors on the input and the output of the mic. Uh, the, the input capacitor is uh, a relic from uh, the defense industry uh, and they're like a hundred plus dollars you can find them on eBay, but they're like $130. Um, the output cap is, has copper foil in it, so it's not a metalized, you know, whatever. It's a custom-made output capacitor with copper foil in it. Okay. And why do we pick that? Well, because it sounds good. You know, it gives us the sound that we wanted. And, uh, and that, that sort of obsession is kind of evident top to bottom. Uh, so that's why I say, you know, no compromise. Um, we didn't leave anything on the table. Uh, it's it's really kind of like the best that we are able to make, and uh, and I think you know for anyone who has an opportunity to, to look inside this and compare to alternatives that cost the same or more, uh, I think you'll be very pleasantly surprised by what you see and certainly you know what you hear. Uh, but that's anyway that's the Roswell Aztec. Amazing. And what's that retailing for? So the introductory price on this is twenty four ninety nine U S. So it is the most expensive mic we've, uh, we've ever produced, but um, the, the beta customers that have had this mic out in the field and compared to things at twice the price are telling us this one's a keeper. Well, that, that's the thing, it's all relative, right? Because like, if you try and get an authentic replica of a, you're looking at six- $10,000. Yeah, right. Yeah. So, and that's, that's exactly the opposite of what you guys are about. Yeah, yeah, it's an interesting thing. I mean, we're trying to do better than, you know, many other companies at a lower price point, which doesn't make a lot of sense, but uh, it's winning us fans, so. Absolutely. Thanks, Mike. Right on. Day three, and I'm at the Freakport booth with Aaron and Michael from from Freakport. Hi, how you going? 
Nice to be here. And these guys have a really, really interesting piece of gear. This is the Freak port, uh, Freak tube. And this is a USB analog valve processing saturation kind of distortion unit. So the question is, what? <laughs> I'll, take, I'll briefly take you through it and, sure. and, and tell you what it does. Essentially what we're trying to do here, or what we have done, is brought the tubes into your door. So you load up a plug-in in your door just like any other plug-in. The difference being it's real tubes that is processing the sound. We handle all the complex stuff of getting the audio out from that plug-in into the real analog world, doing the processing and control, total recall, all of that stuff. You just use it like a normal plug-in. So it's got the benefits of the digital workflow, but true analog sound. Right. And this particular model, we've got two different types of tubes. Okay. Uh, four tubes in total. You can run four instances, two stereo instances. So it's uh, just as flexible as you know, using a normal plug-in. Yeah, that's really awesome. Um, well, how much do they retail for? So they're available in the US now. Uh, Vintage King have them. Uh, they're 920 is the retail, US. Uh, and yeah, they're available now. Well, for, for four valve preamps, that's what, DAW recall. Yep. Yeah, that's quite reasonable, I think, but no one's doing anything like this. Yeah, to, to make something that's comparable with the high-end equipment, all the converters and everything here, we have not sacrificed on anything whatsoever. We've got 32-bit ESS uh, DACs and uh, ADCs in here. Um, everything's, you know, solid. And, yeah, we hope that it's the right access point for many people to have that high-end sound at true analog in the door. Yep. Amazing. Thank you. We all enjoyed the, uh, the footage there. I kind of didn't film much of the last day because I was truly exhausted. Uh, but there was a lot of fun had and a lot more to see in the future. Thanks everybody for watching. I'll see you in the next video. Goodbye.